Mike Wallace with another television interview in our gallery of colorful people. In television drama, few names have the prestige of that of our guest. Rod Serling is the only writer to have won three Emmy Awards for Requiem for a Heavyweight, Patterns, and The Comedian. We'll talk to him about censorship in television, his fight to say what he believes, and we'll learn what he means by the price tag that hangs on success. Way back in 1951, when television was just a baby, a young man sat in the Cincinnati diner with his wife and came to a momentous decision. He decided to give up the security of his job and take a chance in becoming a freelance television writer. Rod, first of all, let me ask you this. What was it that brought that decision about? Was it a burning desire to write because you felt that you had to say something, or was it just a way to make more money? A combination of many things, Mike. The immediate motive at the time, the prodding thing that pushed me into it, was that I'd been writing for a Cincinnati television station as a staff writer, uh -huh. which is a particularly dreamless occupation, composed of doing commercials, even making up uh, uh, letters of, uh, what do they call it, uh, to plug a product. Somebody has used it. Testimonial? Testimonial yeah. letters. Uh, there, I, as I recall, there was a, uh, a drug, a liquid drug on the market at the time that uh, could cure everything from arthritis to a fractured pelvis. And I actually had to write testimonial letters. And on that particular day, I just had it. And though I had been freelancing concurrent with the staff job, the best year I'd ever had, I think we netted about $700, which is hardly even grocery money. Yeah. And that one night, we just decided to you know, sink or swim and go into it. So you went, you came here to New York? Uh, not immediately. We stayed on six months, I guess, in Ohio, and came to New York. Uh, started principally in Lux Video Theater, then live in half hour emanating from New York. I did 11 shows for them, and I was sort of on my way from I that see. point on. And what kind of stuff did you write? Because you said that it wasn't just the money, it was something that you wanted to say that you weren't getting a chance to say in Cincinnati. Well, in those days, uh, Lux Video, as one show, was doing reasonably adult stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, these, of course, were not Playhouse 90s, nor were they award-winning shows, but they were reasonably mature things uh, that even today stand up pretty well. And uh, I was doing Lux Video, Craft Theater, the early so-called pioneer days of television, which, of course, are hardly pioneer, but anything over eight years old is pioneer style in television. You've come a long way since those early days, and perhaps more than any other writer, your name is figured in the classic battle of the, that is, television writer, uh, the battle of the writer to be his own man. What happens when a writer like yourself writes something that he really believes in for television? I I'm not sure I understand the question, Mike. What happens, you mean, in terms of... Well, we hear a lot about censorship of the writer on TV. We've oh, heard I a good deal about mean. it in your own case, especially. Well, depending, of course, on the thematic treatment you're using, if you have the temerity to try to dramatize a theme, that involves any particular social controversy currently extant, then you're in deep trouble. For instance? Uh, a racial theme, for example. My the case in point, I think uh, a show I did for the Steel Hour some years ago, three years ago, called Noon on Doomsday, yeah. which was uh, a story which purported to tell what was the aftermath of the alleged kidnapping in Mississippi of the Till Boy, yeah. the young Chicago Negro. And I wrote the script using black and white uh, initially, then it was changed uh, to suggest an unnamed foreigner. Then the locale was moved from the south to, the, to New England. And I'm convinced they'd have gone up to Alaska or the North Pole if, and using Eskimos as a possible minority, except I suppose the costume problem was of sufficient severity not to attempt it. But it became a lukewarm, vitiated, emasculated kind of show. You went along with it, though? All the way. I protested. I went down fighting, as most television writers do. Yeah thinking in a strange, oblique, philosophical way that better say something than nothing. In this particular show, though, by the time they had finished taking Coca-Cola bottles off the set because the sponsor claimed that this had southern connotations, suggesting to what depth they went to make this a clean, antiseptically, rigidly uh, acceptable show, uh, why it bore no relationship at all to what we had purported to say in initially. Patty Chayefsky has talked about the insidious influence of what he calls pre-censorship. How does that work? Uh, pre-censorship is a practice, I think, of most television writers. I can't speak for all of them. This is the prior knowledge of the writer of those areas which are difficult to try to get through. 
And so a writer will shy away from writing those things which he knows he's going to have trouble with on a sponsorial or an agency level. We practice it all the time. We just do not write those themes which, you know are going, which we know are going to get into trouble. Who's the culprit? Is it the network, the sponsor? It sure is not the FCC. No, it's certainly not the FCC, ideally speaking, of course. It's a combination of culprits in this case, Mike. It's partly network. It's principally agency and sponsor. In many ways, I think it's the audience themselves. How do you mean? Well, I'll give you an example. About a year ago, roughly 11 or 12 months ago, on the Lassie show, this is a story usually told by Sheldon Leonard, who was then associated with the show. Lassie was having puppies. And I have two little girls, then aged five and three, who are greatly enamored of this beautiful collie. Mm -hmm. And they watched the show with great interest. And Lassie gave birth to puppies. And Mike, it was probably one of the most tasteful and delightful and warm things uh, depicting what is this, this, this wondrous thing that is birth. And after the show, I, I think there were many congratulations all around because it was a lovely show. The sort of thing I'd love my kids to watch to show them what is the birth process and how marvelous it is. They got many, many cards and letters. Sample card from the Deep South, this was. If I wanted my kids to watch sex shows, I wouldn't have had them turn on that. I could take them to burlesque shows. And as a result of the influx of mail, many of the cards, incidentally, as Sheldon tells it, were postmarked at identical moments, all in the same handwriting, but each was counted as a singular piece of mail. And as a result, the directive went down that there would be no shows having anything to do with puppies, that is, in the actual birth process. Well, obviously, it is this wild, lunatic fringe of letter writers that, that greatly affect what the sponsor has in mind. You can understand the position of the sponsor, can't I, you? In, in many ways, I suppose I can. He's there to push a product. He has a considerable stake, does, in what goes on the air. Most assuredly. And in those cases uh, where, we, where, there, where there is a, a problem of, of, of public taste, in which there is a concern for... for uh, eliciting negative response from a large mass of people. I can understand why the guys are frightened. Sure. I don't understand, Mike, for example, other evidences and instances of, of intrusion by sponsors. For example, on Playhouse 90, not a year ago, a lovely show called Judgment at Nuremberg. Uh, I think probably one of the most competently done and artistically done pieces that 90's done all year. In it, as you recall, uh, mention was made of gas chambers. Yeah. And the line was deleted, cut off the cut off the, cut off the uh, soundtrack. And uh, it, might, it mattered little to these guys that the gas involved in concentration camps was cyanide, which bore no resemblance, physical or otherwise, to, to the gas used in stove. They cut the line. Because the sponsor was... He did not want that awful association made between what was the horror and the misery of Nazi Germany with the nice, chrome, wonderfully antiseptically clean, beautiful kitchen appliances that they were selling. Now, this is an, is an example of sponsor interference, which is so beyond logic and which is so beyond taste. This I rebel against. You've got a new series coming up called The Twilight Zone. You are writing as well as acting ex executive producer on this one. Who controls the final product? You are the sponsor. We have what I think, at least uh, theoretically anyway, because it hasn't really been put into practice yet, a good working relationship. We're in questions of taste in questions of the art form itself, in questions of drama, I'm the judge, because this is my medium and I understand it. I'm a dramatist for television. This is the area I know. I've been trained for it, I've worked for it, for 12, in it for 12 years, and the sponsor knows his product, but he doesn't know mine. So when it comes to the commercials, I leave that up to him. When it comes to the story content, he leaves it up to me. Has nothing been changed in the... We changed in 18 scripts, Mike. We have had one line changed, which again was a little ludicrous, but. Of, of insufficient basic uh, uh, concern within the context of the story, not, not to put up a fight. Uh, on a bridge of a British ship, a sailor calls down to the galley and asks, in my script, for a pot of tea, because I believe that it's constitutionally acceptable in the British Navy to drink tea. Yeah. Uh, my, one of my sponsors happens to sell instant coffee, and he took great umbrage, or at least minor umbrage anyway, yeah. with the idea of uh, saying tea. Well, we had a couple of swings back and forth, nothing serious, and we decided we'd ask for a tray to be sent up to the bridge. But in 18 scripts, that's the only conflict we've had. Well, they've it, passed... They've passed what? I mean, every script 
Is pre-censorship, though, involved? Are you simply writing easy? In this particular area, no, because we're dealing with a half-hour show, which cannot probe like a 90, which doesn't use scripts as vehicles of social criticism. These are strictly for entertainment. These adult. are pot boilers. Oh, no. Uh -uh. I wouldn't then call them pot boilers at all. No, these are very adult, uh, I think, high-quality, half-hour, extremely polished films. But because they deal in the areas of fantasy and imagination and science fiction and all, all of those things, uh, there's no opportunity to cop a plea or, or chop an axe or anything. Well, you're not going to be able to cop a plea or chop an axe because you're going to be obviously working so hard on the Twilight Zone that, in essence, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, you've given up on writing anything important for television, right? Yeah. For the, well, uh, again, this is a semantic thing, important for television, I don't know. If by important you mean I'm not going to try to delve into current social problems dramatically, you're quite right, I'm not. You told Kay Gardella of the New York Daily News this. You said, professionally, I don't think Twilight Zone will hurt me, but I must admit I don't think it'll help me either. I'm stepping out of the line of fire. You've had it as far as trying to beat your brains out. Would you just read me the first two lines, Mike? Professionally, I don't think Twilight Zone will hurt me, but I must admit I don't think it'll help me. I either. never said that. I'm convinced it'll help me. I have great pride in this show. In 11 or 12 years of writing, Mike, I can lay claim to at least this. I have never written beneath myself. I've never written anything that I didn't want my name attached to. Mm -hmm. I have probed deeper in some scripts, and I've been more successful in some than others. But all of them that have been on, you know, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take my lick. I, I, they're mine, and that's the way I wanted them. Uh, somebody asked me the other day if this means that uh, uh, I'm going to be a, a, uh, a meek conformist. And I, my answer is no. I'm just acting the role of a tired nonconformist. <laughs> And I don't want to. I don't want to fight anymore. Uh, I don't want to. want to fight anymore. I don't want to have to battle sponsors and agencies. I don't want to have to push for something that I want and have to settle for second best. I don't want to have to compromise all the time, which in essence is what the television writer does if he wants to put on controversial themes. Well, then why do you stay in television? I stay in television because I think it's very possible to perform a, a function of providing adult, meaningful, exciting, challenging drama without dealing in controversy necessarily. This, of course, Mike, is not the best of all possible worlds. I am not suggesting that th this is at the absolute millennium. I think it's criminal that we're not permitted to make dramatic note uh, of, of social evils as they exist, of controversial themes as yeah. they are, are, are inherent in our society. I, I think it's ridiculous that drama, which by its very nature should make a comment on those things that affect our daily lives, is in the, is in the position, at least in terms of television drama, of not being able to take, these, to take this stand. But this is the, these are the facts of life. This is the way it exists. And they can't look to me or Shayevsky or Rose or Gore Vidal or J.P. Miller or any of these guys as the, as the uh, precipitators of the big change. It's not for us to do it. Let of course, Shayevsky got out of television. Yeah, he did. And I, I, don't, I can't knock that. I think this takes a relative degree of guts to leave a medium that's made you, that's made you as sociable as a kind of a household name. Patty was the first guy to kind of lend stature to the television writer. Uh, prior to Patty Shayevsky, most of us were considered to be two-headed hacks who worked around the clock and used boy-girl situations in any one of 5,000 different routine manners. But Patty gave us a stature. And I respect Patty's decision to leave. He felt that he wasn't satisfied with doing things half-best. Do, do you think you could make it outside of television? Me? Yeah. I'm not sure I could. And I suppose this is an admission of a kind of weakness or at least a sense of insecurity on my part. I've never had a Broadway play produced. What few motion pictures I've written have been somewhat less than spectacular. And I suppose I stay in the medium partly as an admission of, uh, I, I want to I stay in the womb. This is the medium I understand. These are the tools and techniques that I've been versed in for many years. Uh, Maybe I don't want to, you know, get stuck up on the board and get shot at with darts in a Broadway play when I'm not sure I'm prepared for it. But Patty was willing to take the chance. Gore Vidal writes novels. Bob Arthur did Broadway. What about you and Knowles? Ultimately, I'd love to write a novel, and I think next year I'll start my play. Requiem was uh, under option. I was, it was written as a play, and I gave them their money back, and I want to do it over again. But I stay in the medium also because I happen to like the medium. Herb Brodkin, who was a TV producer who was associated with some of your earlier plays, has said this about you. He said, Rod is either going to stay commercial or become a discerning artist, but not both. I remember the quote. Uh, he got... Uh, he, got it, he gave it to Gilbert Milstein when Milstein was doing a profile on me in the New York Times. I didn't understand it at the time. I, I failed to achieve any degree of understanding in the ensuing years, which are three in number. 
if I, I presume uh, Herb means that inherently you cannot be commercial and artistic. You cannot be commercial and quality. You cannot be commercial concurrent with having a, a preoccupation with the level of storytelling that you want to achieve. And this I have to reject. I think you can be, I don't think calling something commercial tags it with a kind of an odious suggestion that it stinks, that it's something raunchy to be ashamed of. I don't think uh, if you say commercial means to be publicly acceptable, what's wrong with that? As long, the, the, the essence of my argument, Mike, is that as long as you are not ashamed of anything you write, be, if you're a writer, as long as you're not ashamed of anything you perform if you're an actor, and I'm not ashamed of doing a television series. I could have, right, I could have done probably 30 or 40 film series over the past five years. I, I presume at least I've turned down that many mm -hmm. with, uh, with great guarantees of cash, with great guarantees of, of financial security, but I've turned them down because I didn't like them. I did not think they were quality, and God knows they were commercial. Uh, but I think uh, innate in what Herb says is this suggestion made by many people that you can't have public acceptance and still be artistic. And I, as I say, I have to reject that. One of your most recent plays was one called The Velvet Alley, right? Right. It was about the corrupting influences of Hollywood and big money. Right. Where'd that come from? Your own experiences? Many. Part of it was very autobiographical. Part of it was a composite of, other, of, of observation of other people involved. Well, what do you mean by the corrupting influence of Hollywood and big money? What does that, what, what, what well, I didn't, saying? I didn't mean to suggest that, that corruption had a geographical tag, that it was necessarily no. the corruption of Hollywood. What I tried to suggest dramatically was that when you get into the big money, particularly in the kind of detonating, exciting, explosive, overnight way that our industry permits, there are certain blandishments that a guy can succumb to, and many do. Such as? Uh, a preoccupation with status, with the symbols of status, with the heated swimming pool that's 10 feet longer than the neighbors, with the big car, with the concern about billing, uh, all these things. In a sense, rather minute things, really, in context, but th that become disproportionately large in a guy's mind. And also, because those become so large, what becomes small I think probably the really valuable things, and I know this sounds corny and no. it's sort of buckwheatish to say that things like having a family, being concerned with raising children, being concerned with where they go to school, being concerned with a good marital relationship, all these things I think are of the essence. Uh, unfortunately, and the problem as I tried to dramatize in the Velvet Alley, was that the guy who makes a success is immediately assailed by everybody. And you suddenly find yourself having to compromise along the line, giving so many hours to work and a disproportionate number of fewer hours to family. Yeah. And this is inherent in our business. How many hours a day do you work right now as executive producer and or writer on? 12 to 14 hours a day. How many days a week? Seven. Uh, and uh, I don't mean now, seriously, I'm not asking for figures here, but obviously the Twilight Zone is your own creation. You're doing it for money. I think that our audience would be fascinated to know. And again, I, I, I don't want to get too specific, but uh, how rich can a fella get under these circumstances? Well, if the show is successful, he can get tremendously rich. He can make a half a million dollars, I suppose. Half a million dollars of what? A year? Uh, over a period of three or four years, I suppose, yeah. But Mike, I, I'm not... Again, this sounds defensive and it probably sounds phony, but I'm not nearly as concerned with the money to be made on this show as I am with the quality of it, and I can prove that. Uh, I have a contract with Metro Golden Mare which guarantees me something in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million dollars over a period of three years. This is a contract I'm trying to break and get out of so I can devote time to a series which is very iffy, which is a very problematical thing. It's only guaranteed 26 weeks, and if it only goes 26 weeks and stops, I'll have lost a great deal of money. But I would rather take the chance and do something I like, something I'm familiar with, something that has a built-in challenge to it. It's even possible, though, that if it is a success, you could make well over the $2 million that you suggested right. four and years, a half a million apiece. Quite right, but I happen to feel after a year and a half of working 12 to 14 hours a day, it's worth it. And I think I rate it. I think anybody does who works that hard and can create an idea and can, and can uh, make a show go. 30 seconds. Is television good? Some television's wonderful. Some television is exciting and promising and has 
vast potential. Some media, some television is mediocre and bad. But uh, I think it has promise, Mike. I think this is, can conceivably be a real art form. And I stick with it for the reasons I said and because I think that uh, it can only improve and can improve tremendously. And I think aims toward that. Rod Serling's story can be summed up in just a few words. From 40 rejection slips to three Emmy Awards, from a trailer home to a hacienda in Hollywood complete with swimming pool, it hasn't been a long road, but it's been a hard one. And the last couple of miles have been paved with gold. We thank Rod Serling for adding his portrait to our gallery. One of the people other people are interested in. Mike Wallace, that's it for now. You've traveled this dimension of sight and sound and of mind many times before. Treasures of the Twilight Zone.